we're going to be looking at a very powerful subject matter. We've, we've looked at the last days. We've determined, um, you know, we are in the last of the last days. There's no doubt about that. And because of that, there's going to be a lot of turmoil, a lot of upheaval. Now, people say, what is it going to be like in the days of head? Well, here's the way I've been responding. It's going to be the best of times and it's going to be the worst of times. I believe it's going to be the best of times for believers that are seeking the Lord, drawing near to him. I believe it's going to be the worst of times for those that are not seeking the Lord, those that are not born again, or those that are working iniquity and evil in their life. Now, the good news is even for those that are not seeking the Lord or doing evil, you can repent and you can turn to the Lord and be born again, be saved, and things can change radically for you. But one of the things I want to cover now, this has been a powerful study, and it's about the storms of life. Because of being in the last days, there's going to be an accelerated degree of storms. Now, I remember one time when I was studying on storms, looking at the spiritual side, I got to looking at storms in the natural. And so I ended up on some weather type websites and started looking at storms and discovered storms are really a necessary part of our world, <laughs> if you will. There's a lot that's accomplished in storms. Um, and the funny thing of it is there's destructive things that happen, but there's also positive things that happen. One of the things that I've learned in our own life, there is no way that you're going to make it through this life without storms. And, but it's important you discern what type of a storm you're in. And I'm going to give you something to, to look into on that. But, you know, after a natural storm, it kind of brings a clearing. It uh, brings a refreshing after you've come through spiritual storms in life, you'll notice that new strength can come forth in your life. A lot of great things can happen. And so we're going to talk about being able to navigate, first off, discerning the storm that you're in. What type of storm is it? Number two, being able to make it through those storms. And then this is the interesting part and probably one of the more powerful parts, um, becoming the storm. In other words, you as a born again believer, you can either face the storm or you can become the storm. There was no storm that ever met Jesus in which he didn't have authority over it. And because we're in him and he's in us, we have authority over storms. So we can either be tossed about by these storms. And like in the fourth chapter of Mark's gospel, where they were so afraid or we can stand up and exercise our authority against these storms. But Jesus made it clear, we've got authority over the storms in life. He demonstrated it in Mark chapter 4, and we're going to look there in just a moment. And uh, in fact, let's just go over there right now, because this is a very interesting and powerful parable. So what is a parable? A parable is, you can kind of see the word parallel. So basically, Jesus taught by parables. Oftentimes, you may not even realize it. If you're trying to explain something to someone, if you're a supervisor and you're training people that are coming into your company, uh, and maybe it's new to them, you'll explain something they can understand. They'll say, well, do you know how this works here? Like in that, they're like, yeah. Well, it's like that. And then you fill in the blanks and they go, oh, that's, that's what a parable is. You tell a story and it can be true or it can just be some kind of an analogy or an illustration, but it's something that people can understand. Then you lay it parallel beside what you're trying to communicate. And because you're able to understand this, it becomes something that you understand that may be a new area. That's the purpose of Jesus's parables. He would hide spiritual truths in the parables. We're going to go to Mark chapter 4, verse 10. Now we call this the parable of the sower. Uh, but it's, there's a strong argument that it could be called the parable of the soils. 
Because in the parable of the sower, what we often call that, the seed that is talked about in the parable of the sower, the one sowing the seed, is the word of God. And Jesus gives a parable. There was a man that went out to sow seed. As he went out, some seed fell by the wayside. Some fell where it had not much earth, no depth. Some fell among thorns and some fell on good ground. And so we have four areas that we're dealing with. Three out of the four areas failed to produce any kind of a harvest. But when you look into it, it really isn't the seed that failed, which is the word of God. It's the conditions or the environment. So that's why it could arguably, maybe even more accurately be called the parable of the soils. Because the word of God never fails to produce. It's the condition or the environment that it goes into that really determines whether or not it's going to produce. Because you can have, for instance, I think about this as pastor of Church for All Nations. I get up, I speak the word, and you've got a myriad of people from all different backgrounds. And I'll never know this side of eternity, but it may go over to one person and enter into their heart and it could produce a really awesome harvest. And I've seen that people by people telling me that. And then that same sermon, same sowed being preached or sown goes into another person and it doesn't produce. And you will be able to find that the parable of the sower or the soils reveals where it either fails to produce or it actually produces. Now, the purpose of this parable is to explain how the kingdom of God works. And this is one of the most important parables Jesus gave in the entire New Testament. Uh, and basically, he tells this story of that man, as I just shared, going out. But then in verse 10, it says, When Jesus was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Now, there's some powerful things we need to point out here. Number one, when he says it's, it's given to you to know the mystery, you could also say plural. Some of the other uh, gospels will say mysteries, plural. You could use either one. Mystery and mysteries is accurate. Unto you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So what's he saying? There are thousands of people there. And so there are people who have a good heart and are following Jesus and of the kingdom, so to speak. But then there are those on the outside. They're not following the Lord. And everybody hears the same thing, but only those that come aside with the Lord, allowing the Holy Spirit to expound what was sown are going to really understand this parable. And then he goes on further in verse 12 and he says that seeing they may see and not perceive. This is interesting right here. And hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. So today what that's saying is People can access the stories of the Bible, but only believers can access the mysteries of the Bible. Now, what is the mystery of the Bible? If you look that Greek word up, mystery, it's uh, either uh, the Greek word mysterion or mysterion. And obviously where we get the English word mystery. Now, mystery doesn't mean it's something that you cannot understand. It's just something not apparent. It is something that is hidden. Now, the awesome thing is these things are hidden for us, not from us. And the mysteries of the kingdom, the best way I know to describe it is they are the keys of the kingdom of God. So what are keys? And actually what I'm doing right now, I'm going to give you a parable or an illustration we say in our time. So most of us have keys. I have a big key ring. It's got keys to this building. Um, it's got keys to my house, to car, to our mailbox or whatever you want to say. 
all sorts of keys. So that means whatever that key is, there's a lock on something. Now it's got a lock on it to protect it, not from me, but from thieves. So the fact that I have a key tells me I have authority to access that. So like my mailbox, you know, um, you got all these mailboxes, you know, and you go down there and you put your key in and it's not to keep me out, it's to keep somebody else out uh, from getting into the mail. <laughs> it's funny, our next door neighbor email thing where, you know, I've actually, we've had neighbors and it's a massive area that it covers that caught people stealing mail. And uh, so the bottom line of it, a key represents fact you have authority to access something, but you have to put the key in and unlock whatever it is that's locked so you can access that. And basically, this is what Jesus is doing. Parables that he gives are like the keys, the mysteries of the kingdom. And when the Holy Spirit illuminates those, it allows us to access those and those unlock the powers of the kingdom of God. And so I also like to point this out. It doesn't, Jesus did not say, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. He said, these are the keys of the kingdom. What's the difference? Well, like this building here, we can give a key. Let's say we have a subcontractor. We'll give a temporary key to a subcontractor, but it only accesses one part of the building. But let's say particular staff, depending on what level they're at, they'll have the keys of the building. They can get in every room, every closet, every office. And that's the difference between the keys to a building and the keys of the building. So you and I are born again. That means we're going to make heaven, but we've got more than just a key to heaven. Jesus said, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. Heaven is full of treasure that we need to access. Jesus taught us to pray that in the uh, Lord's Prayer. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, even as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you loose in earth is loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind in earth is bound in heaven. So what that means is the power to bind and loose is in the earth. You know, a lot of people think that the move of God in the earth comes from heaven, but really the move from heaven is controlled by the movement here on earth. What do you mean by that, Mark? What I mean is, is that as a born again, spirit filled believer in this earth, you and I have authority and access in this earth and we can bring heaven to earth. That's what we're instructed to do. You know, a lot of the focus of ministry today is get people to heaven. Well, that's important. We want to get them to heaven, but really it's to get heaven to earth. That's what we are needing to do right now, that we begin to bind up the powers of God, uh, darkness. We begin to loose the powers of, of God in this earth. We begin to usher in signs and wonders and miracles. So in Mark chapter four, let's keep reading here. We're going to jump down to verse 23. Jesus says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear more shall be given. So interesting thing. When Jesus was speaking the parable, anytime he did that or had a crowd or even to the disciples that had come aside, I guarantee a 99 plus percent of the people had these little things on the sides of their head called ears. And in some cases, he might have had 20 or 30,000 people when he was feeding the people. But why would he say, if any man have ears to hear? Because you can have these ears and not be hearing what the Lord is saying. You have two sets of ears. You have outer ear and inner ear. And so it's important that you understand the fact that you hear what the Lord is saying. That's why he would, he would ask the question, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Because 
thousands of people heard Jesus speaking, but only a few people really heard what he was speaking. And then he gives us this exhortation here. Take heed what you hear with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you and unto you that hear it shall more be given. So I think I've done this illustration. So you can see here on my desk, there's this little mat. And let's say that, that or let's just say that my desk here is the totality of the truth. This is the full measure of truth, a particular truth that's being spoken. So I hear the truth. But then Jesus said, now you need to be careful and take heed, pay attention what you hear. Because he said, the measure you put on the truth you hear is what's going to come back to you. So let's say I hear the truth, but then I say, well, that, what that means is this right here. Then this is all that is going to be returned back to me. But if I'm careful and I take heed what I hear, then I go back out to the scope of this. Then all that God intends for me has planned for me. The Bible uh, talks about give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, lest at any time we let those things slip away from us. Now, in verse 33, Jesus says this, as many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So this is powerful. So basically, think of this. Parables contain the mysteries of the kingdom. I looked up the Greek word for mystery, and it's a very powerful meaning. It, it deals with and pertains to the forces that either accelerate and advance the kingdom or retard and slow down the kingdom or stop it. So it's very important that we understand the mysteries of the kingdom. It's, it's something that uh, the best way it's been said is everyone has access to the stories of the Bible, but very few ever access the mysteries. But yet Jesus said it's given to us. And so we have to be diligent to hear because it's only as we are able to hear and this is on a personal basis. You don't have to go to church to hear from God, although you should be in church to not forsake the assembling of yourselves, your own personal relationship with God. You spend time with the Lord. You spend time with Him in secret, in the quiet place. And, and as you spend time with Him, the Holy Spirit, as you minister to Him, He ministers to you. And so it's when you and I are alone that the Lord begins to expound these things and reveals those things to us. So now here's one of the things that I think is probably one of the more important things we're going to get out of the broadcast here. I want to talk to you about three types of storms, three types of storms. You really should take notes on this because if you're in a storm right now, it is important that you discern the storm that you're in. And this is from a very dear friend of mine, uh, Tony Cook, who wrote the book, the storms of life help from heaven when all hell breaks loose. So we establish the fact you're not going to make it through life without encountering storms. And so the important thing is that you discern them and that you respond properly. And then we're going to learn about the fact not only must you discern the storm and respond properly, but it's time, and, and it comes to the point, we as believers must become the storm. So the first storm we're going to talk about is the Jonah storm. Now, what is the Jonah storm? Well, it's taken from the book of Jonah. And you'll remember that God came to Jonah and said, Jonah, I want you to go down to Nineveh. Their sin is great. It's come up before me. And I want you to preach repentance to them. And this is the most interesting thing. Jonah, it says in the scripture, ran from the presence of the Lord. And I've been studying this somewhat. It's kind of a speculation. What was Jonah's deal? Well, first off, you have to understand how wicked the Ninevites were. I did some studying on them. And let me tell you, they were a brutal people. If you took Hamas, if you took ISIS, if you took the Taliban and any of those other uh, terrorist uh, people, 
and maybe even add a, a little bit of steroids to it, that was the Ninevites. Um, it was a very wicked city, full of idolatry, full of evil. They would flay their enemies and, and hang their skins on the wall. Can you even fathom that? They would impale people. They would get these, these, uh, just these pillars that were pointed. They would take people and shove them down on there and let them die a slow death. And that was a form of their intimidation. And yet God loved these people. And God wanted to be able to spare them and cause them to repent. And for some reason, Jonah didn't want to go preach to them. And it says he ran from the presence of the Lord. So the Jonah storm is caused by personal disobedience and rebellion. Because you remember what happened. It says, the Lord says, uh, the Lord said, or the scripture says that the Lord had a fish prepared for Jonah. And Jonah was swallowed up by that fish and three days and nights in that belly of the fish, Jonah had a change of heart. The fish vomited him up. Jonah went and preached repentance. They repented and it was an amazing turnaround. So if you're in a Jonah storm, you have to discern, are you in that storm because of rebellion? Are you in that because you disobeyed the Lord directly? Because there's only one way out of that storm. That's to repent of your wrongdoing and come into alignment in obedience with the Lord. The second storm, that is the disciple storm. And I love Mark chapter four and chapter five, because that is a storm that you may be in because of perfect obedience. In other words, Jesus had just preached the parable of the sower that we're talking about. And then he said, let us go to the other side. And so what ended up happening, they got into the boat. Jesus is in the boat with them. They're sailing to the other side. Good Lord, you can't get in any more perfect obedience than that. The Lord told us we're going to the other side. And then Jesus is in the boat with you. Is that perfect obedience or not? Then a life-threatening storm comes. And they're afraid that they're going to die and perish. So they wake Jesus up and all of a sudden they're like, Master, don't you care that we're dying? We're going to perish. He gets up, rebukes the storm, calms the sea, and then rebukes them. And he asks them, where's your faith? And so it could be, and this is where you have to discern it, that you're in the disciple storm. You obeyed God perfectly and the storm came because the devil is afraid of what's ahead. And as we're going to learn, there were some of the most powerful miracles in Jesus' life and ministry that took place in Mark chapter 5. So what is the solution? If you find yourself in the disciple storm, the solution is exercise spiritual authority. Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. And so if you find yourself in a storm, the disciple storm, because of perfect obedience, you need to exercise your faith. And then the third and the final storm is what's called the storm of Paul. And that's taken from Acts chapter 27. And you know the story. Paul's storm is a storm that's caused by other people's disobedience. So Paul's a prisoner, they get in the ship and the Lord shows him that the trip is going to be with peril and loss of life. He warns them, they ignore his warning and they set sail anyway and they find themselves in a horrific storm. And all of a sudden, Paul stands in the gap, believing God, an angel comes to him and said, life will be spared. You know, there's gonna be a crash here. And basically the storm of Paul is when somebody else's disobedience and rebellion is brought you where you're at today. It could be your spouse that is divorcing you, your child that is rebelling against God, a friend, a coworker, your boss. So what is the response if you find yourself in the storm of Paul? The way through this storm is to exercise persevering faith Stand in the gap, find the scriptures that you can stand on. And that is the way you make it through uh, the storm of Paul. So those are the three storms. The last thing, can you be in more storm than one? I believe absolutely, positively. 
I believe America is experiencing all three of these storms. And we're going to talk more about that on the next broadcast. I want to pray for you right now and ask that the Lord will give you that discerning. Lord, I pray over the viewers today. Lord, give them and grant them discernment as to which storm they may be facing and also to see it in our nation, Lord, and how we respond. And we thank you for being faithful to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to call us if you would like further prayer. Our team is standing by. The number's on your screen. And maybe you have something you need to share, uh, questions you may have. Call right now. And also, I'd love for you to email me. Let me know how this series is impacting you. And you can send your prayer request in on email. Visit markcowart.org. And also be sure to visit the resources there. Look at those. And visit my YouTube channel. Be sure to like it and share it with others. Share the broadcast. And thanks for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you on the next broadcast. Till then, may the Lord bless you richly. Thank you for watching this video and be sure to explore more of my YouTube channel for more content like this. And if you want to learn more about what we do or if you want to partner with us, be sure to visit my website at markcowart.org. May the Lord bless you richly.